rescue, what's your emergency? Hi, hi, it's Marilyn Mills calling, I'm at Cabago. What's Our your... house is burning to the ground and we're locked in the garage. You're locked in the garage? Yes. Okay. You can't get out. You can't get out. Is it a bushfire? Yes. Okay, just one moment ma'am. It was the triple zero call that Marilyn Mills from Cobargo hoped would save her life as fire tore through her property on New Year's Eve. Three phone calls to you so far. Hey, so you've called someone already, have you? Yes, yes, I've called three times. Okay. The whole place is going. Okay, there is a truck on the way, okay? So you, you're, in the, yes. you're in the garage, is there any smoke in the garage? Not yet, but it's pitch black. Okay. They're on the way, mate. They're on the way. Just, just shelter in place. Do your best, all right? I'll call the RFS, okay? But despite repeated assurances from the operator, they never came. He said the RFS are on the way. Well, they haven't seen them yet. And I don't know what date it is today, but I haven't got here yet. They're obviously taking the long way around. Yeah. See? Oh, he's a good boy. Like, I lost everything. I lost every photograph I've ever had. I lost everything I've ever had. Everything. So I just have nothing from 57 years of life. I have nothing. If my horses hadn't survived, I would not be here. No one has the capacity to help everyone um, uh, we cannot put a fire truck at every home. In New South Wales alone, uh, there's over 1.3 million homes that directly abut the bushland interface. No one's got 1.5 million, you know, fire trucks to put in every backyard. It just doesn't work that way. Rumours swirled during the height of the bushfires that the New South Wales Rural Fire Service was under-resourced. Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons says that couldn't be further from the truth. The funding and resourcing for the RFS has never been better. Um, we've, we, we still enjoy record funding today uh, and our, our levels of training, our equipment, our protective, all those sorts of things have never been better. The key resources we've got to call upon have never been better. But Commissioner Fitzsimmons is deeply disappointed with some government decisions this fire season. The Governor-General signed off on uh, the call out of the Australian Defence Force Reserve to surge and bring every possible capability to bear by deploying Armoury Reserve Brigades to fire affected communities across Australia. What was the first you knew of the Prime Minister's decision to call in the Army Reserve? Uh, the first we knew of it uh, was, when the, um, uh, was when the press conference was being held uh, and then I, I went in to see uh, the Premier and the Minister and I went in and said do either of you know anything about this announcement and their message was yes we've just got a we've just got a phone call before the press conference we've got a copy of the we've got a copy of the press release you can sit here and watch it with us if you wish that was the first we all knew about it. Is that the sort of lines of communication that you would like to see examined by the upcoming Royal Commission? Oh, absolutely. And um, as I said during the fires and in one of the press conferences, I did speak to the Prime Minister's office uh, about that. And, and whilst the activation of the reserves was a good thing, I, I don't detract from that at all, it was actually a good thing. Uh, its execution, uh, the, the lack of consultation, uh, launching it on, I think, one of our second worst days of the season uh, at that point in time, uh, it couldn't have been more poorly executed. And when you've got announcements being made with no consultation, it detracts from that public confidence and argument and the demonstration that we're working very cooperatively uh, and in a very coordinated way. The Prime Minister's office has described this incident to 7.30 as a breakdown in communications at the defence liaison level. Warnings have been communicated to state and federal governments that some forest logging is contributing to a heightened risk of fire. Just imagine if we started salvage logging in this kind of country. David Lindenmeyer, Professor of Ecology at the Australian National University in Canberra, has been warning about the link between logging and high severity bushfires since the Black Saturday fires. What the research has shown is that forests are very unlikely to burn for the first seven years, immediately after logging. But then after seven years, there's a very steep increase in the risk of very high severity, what we call crown scorching fire. 
and that effect lasts for about 40 years after the forest has started to regrow. We were very concerned about the risks of young forests reburning. And that's exactly what we've seen in significant parts of East Gippsland in northeastern Victoria. We've written repeatedly to people in government at all levels about these issues. That's to various state premiers, to senior environment ministers, to forestry ministers, uh, right across the board. No botanical key. But it's a warning David says for the most part has been ignored. We've seen no evidence of a true tangible response from government to take away this extra risk that's occurring in forests. We need to move on from, from this ridiculous uh, situation that we're in to better protect communities and make them safer. And this is one way that we can do that, and that is to remove logging from these forests close to, to communities and take away that added risk. In a statement to 7.30, the Victorian Environment Minister Lily D'Ambrosio says the government's forest management policy draws on the work of many experts, including Professor David Lindenmeyer. She also says they've ended old growth forest logging and are phasing out all native forest logging by 2030. Many victims of these fires are also feeling frustrated. Lorena Granados and her husband Gaspar Roman lost their leather goods shop and rental property in the Mogo fires. For me, it felt like, you know, they ripped an organ out of my body. All they've been left with is a few donated tools and leather goods, as well as charity donations. They were told they wouldn't get access to a New South Wales disaster relief grant because they own an investment property and earned over the income limit of $943 per couple per week. I was pretty shocked actually because I've been a taxpayer all my life and I feel like I've paid enough tax to be able to qualify for some assistance when I'm in trouble. I'd really like to find the Roman leather goods in the Gasper Roman. They also tried to apply for a $50,000 small business grant four times, meeting roadblocks at every turn. So they looked at my photos, they wanted before and after photos. My name, my contact details, where the, you know, the addresses and everything. And that was just the registration process. They were told they needed to provide receipts, invoices or quotes to the value of $50,000. Go, go to the filing cabinet and get them out, honey. <laughs> Frustratingly, Lorena was also informed that their building had been mistakenly registered as untouched. I just laughed because I just said, are you kidding me right now? Are you joking with me? She said, no, I'm, I'm serious. We've got here that your built business and your building is untouched. After inquiries from 7.30, the business grant was finally approved. We need to have a degree of humanity and flexibility in the way that we apply the grants. Former Australian Federal Police Commissioner Andrew Colvin is leading the government's National Bushfire Recovery Agency. My job is partly to make sure that the money is getting to where it needs to get via either the state governments or the Commonwealth government or the local governments. And we're talking about taxpayer dollars and public funds, so we need to be sensible about it. We do need a degree of humanity and in, in the way that we go about this, we need to find ways to help people and, and that should be our, our, our overriding principle. So far, only 10% of the government's $2 billion bushfire fund has been spent. Now, there's frustration and I hear that frustration and I appreciate it and I, and I would agree with it as well. Um, it takes time and we're stripping away as much process as we can and trying to tailor the measures and tailor the cash to meet the individual circumstances. I've got five states and territories impacted here across a large portion of the eastern seaboard of Australia right around a Kangaroo Island. The needs of communities, the needs of individuals are quite different. As Aussies we band together because we we have to look after each other. In the wake of these fires, Australians opened their wallets in an unprecedented show of generosity. There are various estimates, but they put it at around more than $500 million. Um, but also just the amount of Australians that actually did give. So there is some survey data indicating that 53% of Australians gave in response to the bushfire crisis. Um, the average amount given was uh, $50 and the median amount given was $121. So um, it, is, it is remarkable. 
complaints have been raised about charities failing to distribute the money to people in need fast enough or spending too much on administration costs. Data provided exclusively to 7.30 indicates that between the beginning of September and the end of February, there were 300 reports to the ACCC about bushfire-related scams, most of which related to charities. The complaints allege misleading, fraudulent and even criminal activity and are still under investigation. I think it's really important for charities to be open and transparent about how they are spending funds, what their plan is, how much they've already distributed, when they're going to distribute the remainder of the funds. They've got websites, they can put that information up there. So communicate with their donors, let them know what you're doing, how you're doing it, when you're doing it. The more information that's out there, I think the more reassured donors will be. During times like this, there are unfortunately people who will try and take advantage of people's generosity, and I think it's really disappointing. The message from both the government and charities sector is that distributing money to victims and supporting affected towns is a long-term project. Keeping communities afloat in the meantime is the real challenge. No one's got unrealistic expectations that things can happen overnight. We can click our fingers and, and immediately make everything the way it was before the fire. But they just want to know, or well, my sense is, people want to know that there is a plan, that, they, that there is hope that the future will be different for them, that they can rebuild, that they can put their community or their lives back together the way that they want. And that's what I'm finding that is the most invigorating part of this, is listening to their stories and trying to give them that bit of hope. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.